Technical support for this episode of Living St. Louis was provided by Mackie Mitchell Architects, celebrating 50 years. Additional support was provided by Bell Fountain Cemetery. This time on Living St. Louis, 50 years after its official dedication, the Gateway Arch still looks pretty good. Nobody'd mess with that. But underneath, they've completed a gut rehab of the museum. It's modern, interactive, and no longer a hidden treasure. We couldn't be happier with how things are turning out and how our visitors are responding. Outside, the park and the riverfront also reworked and revitalized. Trying to continue to build upon what's here and provide a better visitor experience. But the trams, no change there. We tell the story of the man who took the job others didn't want. The ideas he considered and rejected for getting us to the top. Elevators, the Ferris wheel concept, before hitting on an elegant solution. So this was all done in a 14-day period. Well, we're not talking about a big engineering firm. No, we're talking about one, one man. Guy. One man. It's all next on Living St. Louis. It has taken years, but all of the plans, the drawings, the architectural renderings and animations, they've all been turned into the real thing, all the way from Keener Plaza down to the riverfront. It's on time and it's ready for the 4th of July celebration. The arch itself needed no improvement. It is still stunning at the age of 50. That hasn't changed, but how we get there has. The depressed interstate lanes have been covered and now tourists can flow uninterrupted from downtown to the arch grounds. And there's a new front door on what was once a hidden museum and you won't find a more dramatic change than what they've done down there. Here you'll have an interactive experience learning about our city's contribution to westward expansion. It's been more than three years since the Museum of Westward Expansion closed its doors and moved out the talking mannequins and taxidermy. Since then, a new museum space has been excavated and renovations are bringing westward expansion into the modern world. We're taking the maiden voyage down the escalator for the first time ever from the main line. Rhonda Shear is the media, Chief of Museum of Services and Interpretation of at the video, Gateway Arch National Park. No longer are museums a showcased um, event for looking at exhibits and hearing um, esteemed scholars share history from a single perspective. Now museums are saying, come and explore with us. We will share with you the different periods of history, the different perspectives of events. We want you to be actively engaged. No, Mom, it shows you the seats. Look, there's people in there. The new and improved museum at the Gateway Arch features multimedia and audiovisual exhibits, as well as interactive computer simulations. They will have a computer simulation that helps them decide what kind of purchases they want to make to meet or exceed their budget and make wise or unwise decisions <laughs> on what they think will help them when they're on their journey. Amazon wasn't going to come deliver where they were if they didn't make those, so. if they didn't choose correctly. That's right. <laughs> okay, I didn't get very far. What we've tried to do with this exhibit is tell the story of American westward expansion from the perspective of this site where the arch sits today, because this was extremely important to westward expansion. You know, this was where the city of St. Louis started. The old French community was here. Lewis and Clark lived here and, and administered the Louisiana territory. Uh, this was where the covered wagon pioneers outfitted for their trek westward. When people like Shear and Moore began planning these exhibits, they had a diverse group of museum goers in mind. They wanted to ensure they presented the story of westward expansion in a way that would interest visitors of all ages. Here you'll find traditional museum exhibits with objects and historical artifacts and cases mixed in with the modern museum experience. And there was a logic behind it because whenever we would come to something where we'd say, 
you know, that's going to be an awful lot of text. Mm -hmm. We're going to have to write a book and put it on the wall. We thought, could we consolidate that information and somehow put it into uh, one, one of the modern technological exhibits so that there would be, people would have a choice, they wouldn't have to see the whole thing, and they'd be able to kind of go through and pick out the information that they thought was interesting to them. Oh, this is cool, this is really cool. It actually goes this way. Well, we're in a visual world. <laughs> we, we are, yeah, and I think all through that was our main goal was to create things that were visual. Mm -hmm. And of course, you've probably noticed throughout, we also have a lot of tactile displays. Mm -hmm. So even people who have low vision or are blind can come in and still get that visual idea of what the West was through the tactile displays that we've put together. Moore designed a model of the St. Louis Riverfront in its heyday and a storefront using original cast iron columns has been erected. And giving people an idea of what it would have been like to walk down the street in St. Louis at a particular point in time. This is the facade of the Rock House. It was built in 1818 and is St. Louis's oldest architectural feature, our oldest building. Some of the rocks were saved from the old building. We had the uh, windows and the shutters and other components of it that were all reused in this reconstruction. The Rock House was originally built for the Missouri Fur Trading Company and later served as a restaurant, a bar, and a jazz nightclub. It was taken down in 1959. I can't believe all those rocks were saved. Aren't they amazing? They were down in the basement of the courthouse all these years in a pile for the hope that someday it could be recreated in an exhibit space. Museum curators have evaluated history with a wide view critical analysis by consulting with tribal neighbors, different ethnic groups, and diverse cultural backgrounds. I am most excited about the fact that this place is going to become a thriving teaching and learning community. We want this not to be a place where people just come and browse through and read what other people have written. We want this to be a place where people contribute to the current story and the current analysis and participate in some way to share their perspective to today's generation as well as generations of the future. In 2015, St. Louis marked the 50th anniversary of the completion of the Gateway Arch. But that was just the completion of the building, the final piece being put in place. There was a lot of work still to be done on the inside, three more years of work. So now we're celebrating the 50th anniversary of the completion of the fully functional Gateway Arch. And a big part of being fully functional was the trams, north leg and south leg, both operating at peak capacity. And while we have Aero Sarnen to thank for the magnificent design of the Gateway Arch, when it came to getting people to the top, he had no idea, not a clue. Yes, it's Aero Sarnen's arch, but this tram, this is Dick Bowser's tram. Aero Sarnen worked and reworked his design for the monument on the St. Louis Riverfront, and always part of his plan was for some sort of observation deck at the top. But on one of his early drawings, all he had was a door on the lower level, simply marked elevator. No one knew how. You know, the Sarnen firm had contacted engineers. They'd contacted all the major elevator companies. The elevator companies wanted nothing to do with it. The job of designing a unique transport system for a unique building would fall to a guy who was at the right place at the right time. The place was Moline, Illinois, in 1960. An executive at an elevator company there had just turned down Saarinen and the Arch Project when in walked a friend of his named Dick Bowser. And when he walked in the door, his friend pointed his finger at him and said, I didn't even think of you. Park Service historian Bob Moore heard the story he from Dick Bowser himself. The friend dialed the Saarinen firm, and when they got someone on the phone and put Dick on the phone, the first question they asked him was, can an elevator go around a curve? That was the big stumbling block, you know, to trying to figure this out. Bowser was an elevator guy, but not your run-of-the-mill elevator guy. He and his father were in the mechanical parking garage business. 
Instead of ramps, their Bowser system garages moved cars on elevators, up and down, horizontally, diagonally. Yes, Bowser said, what Sarn had wanted was possible. And after thinking about it for a while, he agreed to give it a shot. So he had a two-week deadline to come up with two weeks. a concept. Two wow. weeks. And he went back home, worked in his basement, worked almost you know, 18, 20 hours a day, his wife feeding him coffee and uh, just um, going on pure adrenaline. And he went through a lot of mental gymnastics to try to come up with something that what might be workable. So this is, uh, Jen, this is all the oversight? Okay. Dick Bowser's sketches and diagrams, his notes and calculations, they're in big file folders in the archives in the old courthouse. And you can see Bowser trying out ideas and rejecting them. There were only a few criteria that had to be met. One was the system could not distort the exterior of the gateway arch. The other was that it had to be able to move thousands of people in an eight-hour period. And as Dick Bowser sat at his drafting table, he literally spelled out the problem. Ideas that were okay for loading were bad for viewing. Others were bad for loading, but okay for viewing. His goal, a system okay to load, okay for viewing. So these are showing when he was doing multiple elevators. Of course, the first option was an elevator, but a traditional elevator only goes up about 300 feet before the curve gets in the way. In fact, there is a service elevator that gets about that far. People could transfer to a second angled elevator halfway up, but you'd need equipment there and an observation deck for people waiting to transfer. And adding windows, by the way, was not the deal breaker. The real problem was the second elevator would have to be smaller, carry fewer people, and that would mean a bottleneck. You know, you've still got to have them waiting around and they're kind of building up in these, these observation yeah. rooms. Bowser's conclusion about standard elevators, impractical. This is the Ferris wheel concept and yeah. you can see people riding in the chairs. He started working out a system that would provide a continuous ride up and down and under the arch. People would be on Ferris wheel style seats but he immediately saw a problem there, jotting down this note. The free swinging feature would be a temptation to daredevils. He started working on different enclosed seating compartments that could carry a number of people, and you begin to see the emergence of the pod concept. And instead of spacing the seats continuously, like on a Ferris wheel or a ski lift, he started grouping together the seats, here in five different sections. At the bottom, one group would be loading, one group would be unloading. At the top, one group would be enjoying the view through windows. But two groups would be stopped halfway up and halfway down. To keep people from being claustrophobic, they would actually put windows in the leg of the arch at the two points where mm -hmm. people would stop midway uh, in the leg. So well, That sort of messes with Saarinen's beautiful concept though. Isn't well it, it did and, and there were a lot of things that uh, are surprising to us today that they were considering. Um, there was a bubble top at one time that looked like a Canadian Pacific train. Um, there were all different things that were being considered. The arch itself was still in flux at the time. In his Ferris wheel system sketch, there's a single motor driving the entire operation, and Bowser figured chains or cables would have to be a half mile long, too long to be practical. Plus, this conveyance would have to be centered inside the arch, so that when it got to the top, there wouldn't be any room for equipment or emergency stairways. At first, he was using the whole triangle right. of the arch. Which gets smaller and smaller as you go up. So right. That's something he has. But that was one of the biggest things that during that two-week period Dick was wrestling with was, you know, everything that he tried to put into the leg of the arch, by the time it got to the top, it was too big. Yeah, well, yeah. So his eureka moment was, I've got to design something that fits at the top and have it come yeah. down. Bowser's solution combined the Ferris wheel and elevator. It would have rotating seats like a Ferris wheel, but they would be inside these circular pods, and those would do the rotating within a fixed ring. 
The rings would run on curving rails with cables and counterweights like a traditional elevator. And this wouldn't be a continuous circular ride. Separate trams would run up and down each leg. At the top, stopping just short with steps leading to an observation deck. This was the idea Dick Bowser brought to Aerosaridon. At the end of this two weeks, he came up with the concept that we currently use in the arch to take people to the top. Welcome to the top, please exit chair car and up. And the other thing that he did that the architecture firm and the designers loved was he decided that because of the general size he was getting with this capsule, he could make it so that he would only utilize half of the triangle inside the arch. So that allowed space for an emergency stairwell, uh, all of the infrastructure, whether it be you know the electrical or whatever else, could go on the other side of the triangle. So this was all done in a 14-day period. Well, we're um, not talking about a big engineering firm. No, we're, we're talking, talking about one, one man. Guy. One man, yeah, came up with the concept. And he doesn't have an engineering degree either, right? Right, right. He didn't have an engineering degree. He'd gone to the University of Maryland for a couple of years. World War II had come along, and so he'd gone into the service, into the Navy, and never returned to his college studies. After the initial concept was approved, there had to be some changes. Bowser originally had 10 cars on every tram, and each capsule only sat four people. But he had to decrease the number of cars, he had to squeeze in one extra seat, and you can blame Aero Saarinen for that. What happened was Saarinen changed the shape of the arch. The arch legs originally had been further apart. Saarinen pulled them closer together, but that made for an even tighter curve at the top, and Bowser's stairs now interfered with the end of the 10-car tram. So they could only fit eight at the top. To keep each tram carrying 40 people, Bowser had to now arrange seats to accommodate five butts and 10 knees. And now the question was efficiency. Could people squeeze in and out fast enough for these trams to move enough people per hour? Hero Saarinen put his own children to work to test that out. He had a cardboard model of the, um, of the little tram capsule. It was cardboard, but, but there was uh, good seating. So he, we were supposed to crawl in and crawl out, and then crawl in and crawl out, and then crawl in and crawl out. And Daddy um, held a stopwatch and, and timed it so that he would understand how many people uh, could be moved through the arch. Uh, in an hour, for instance. There were some things that didn't uh, work quite right that needed to be ironed out. and So they decided to hire Dick and bring him in uh, just as a full-time employee so that he could be here standing by and could make sure everything was working properly. Dick Bowser died in 2003 at the age of 82, and he is honored at the Arch if you look for him. When they put up the mural called The Builders, there along with Saarinen, Luther Lee Smith, Mayors Dickman and Tucker, U.S. Representative Lenore K. Sullivan, and others, is Richard Bowser. He's a very humble kind of guy, and he didn't want to toot his own horn too much, but you could tell how uh, amazingly uh, proud he was of his achievement. And, uh, you know, I, one of the most memorable times I remember with Dick was when his uh, destroyer crew had a reunion here in St. Louis and he was able to bring them down to the arch and we took them all up and he could open the panels and show them all the different things that he had uh, invented that made this work. Uh, he was, it was a very happy day for him. I remember as a young girl growing up in Detroit, a trip my family made here to St. Louis. One of our stops was the Gateway Arch. It had just been completed. There wasn't even any landscaping here. How times have changed. Some of the latest changes visitors will find include better accessibility to get here to the park and more park once they arrive. Yeah, we're really excited. 
Eric Moracheski is executive director of the Gateway Arch Park Foundation. His organization oversaw a decade-long planning, redesign, and renovation process at a cost of $380 million. Improving the visitor experience was the top priority, and that's immediately apparent if you're on foot heading into the park from the direction of Keener Plaza. We took out Memorial Drive, so that was a big transition for us, is you're not walking across four lanes of traffic anymore. So you can really just feel like you're just in a park setting, which is exactly what you were before, but it was interrupted. We really tried to maintain the Dan Kiley design of the park, and so the pathways are very similar. So we took down the old parking garage, we turned that into a seven and a half acre park for people to go play in, enjoy themselves, join us for our Blues at the Arch concerts in August, just have a good time here. So with the old parking garage gone, where will visitors leave their cars? They're gonna park in our Stadium East garage, in our Keener garages. Those parking garages are the same distance to the new entrance as the old parking garage was to our north leg. So we're not asking people to go further. The ponds dotting the Arch Park are unchanged, but the landscaping has been enhanced. There are many more trees than the 1800 prior to the renovation. We have 4,200 trees across our park and the most prominent type of tree you see here is this London plane tree and these are lining our alleys and what they're what they are is they're about four or five years old they were grown with a liquid biological amendment which is a removal of fertilizer from these grounds so that we can grow these with all natural ingredients so that we're not polluting the river we're keeping this to a really healthy environment and that was done through a donation of spent grain from Anheuser-Busch so we like to think that our trees are enjoying the beer that we all do every day too. So the beer was the fertilizer? The beer is the fertilizer. New lamp posts installed around the park resulted from an unexpected discovery. That's right. These are new light poles that we were putting in. And what's unique about them is these were found in an Aeroserenin sketchbook that he had designed but never brought to life. And so our landscape architects found them, made some slight adjustments so that the light would spread across the ground better as opposed to a more focused light. And they brought them to life on the grounds and they so tie into the iconic structure that you have behind me. They can go down to the riverfront through the new East Slope pathways and there's, they never have to touch a stair if that's a problem or if you are mother pushing a stroller. It's just very simple for people to get all the way from the city down to the river. We raised Lenore K. Sullivan 30 inches to take out 67% of our flood days so that we have a more active and vibrant riverfront. There's bike paths down there. There are vendors down on the riverfront that are selling food and drinks and souvenirs. We've really just trying to continue to build upon what's here and provide a better visitor experience, whether it's a local visitor or someone coming in from out of town. The Gateway Arch has been with this city, a symbol of this city, for half a century. And while it is a work of art, it is also a building. Sleek and curved and unique, but a building nonetheless. So we end tonight's program focusing not on the visionaries and designers, but the people who took that vision and design and assembled it piece by piece. often think of the guys uh, that built the arch in the same way I think that oh maybe Stephen Ambrose looked at the uh, World War II veterans that he interviewed you know I mean, real modest guys that you know we were just doing our job kind of thing and uh, yet they did an extraordinary thing you know they may downplay it uh, and say well I worked on you know 20 bridges and 15 high steel buildings and you know they go on and on but then they pull out a scrapbook about the arch they don't have a scrapbook on any of the other projects they worked on here's a scrapbook about the arch the arch is is a, is known as a phenomena it, it's one of the great engineering feats but when you compare it with things like the Panama Canal uh, going to the moon, it's, uh, it's really not that big a deal. <laughs>
we did what someone asked us to do, what we were supposed to do. We did our, we did our job. Well, there were some real characters, I'll say that down there. I, I guess it took a special type, maybe, I don't know. It was like uh, being in a fun house. If you were in there at, at that particular time, they had a, just a, a wire running down the ceiling, and about every 10 feet, they just had a, a bare light bulb hanging on it, you know, with about that much tail. And uh, as a, the, a Derek would swing over the side, well, it would move, and those lights would dance, well, it would cast shadows all over. It, nothing was level. The only place with level is if you stood on a step or a platform, but everything else was out of whack around you. You couldn't see the ground, so you didn't know where you, you know, your orientation was screwed up. Uh, depending upon the time of the year, it would create an atmosphere in there where there would be fog. And you would have, there, from the top, like in the summertime, from the top to the bottom, you could have as much as 30 degrees difference in temperature it would create an atmosphere in there where there would be fog. So I know my kids and grandkids say, oh, daddy built that. <laughs> yeah, so yeah, it's, it's a feat. You look back at it, it's a heck of a job. It'll be here long after I'm gone. Uh, I've worked on bridges, buildings, towers. And, uh, just if it's iron work, I've worked on. That arch is something you can back off and look at it and be proud of. Yeah, not many people can uh, build a national monument, I guess. Not that many of them. Funding for Living St. Louis is made possible through the Mary Rankin Jordan and Eddie A. Jordan Charitable Foundation and through the generous support of the members of KETC.